Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Fossil Friday Web Chats with the Western Science Center and the Raymond M. Alf Museum. I'm Brittany Stoneberg, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Gabriel Santos. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and today, uh, we have a very fun uh, a speaker set up for you. This is Dr. Lisa White. Hi, Lisa. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. It's great to have you, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. I think the uh, questions that you uh, talk about and ask in your talk is something we've all encountered. Right. Oh, yeah. I don't know how many times I've heard that question. Oh, my God. Over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for everybody, let me go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Lisa White, if you are not familiar with her. Um, so Lisa is a Director of Education and Outreach at the UC Museum of Paleontology, also known as UCMP, where she develops and disseminates learning materials on evolution in the fossil record, the nature and process of science, and connects broader communities to museum collections through virtual field trips and mobilization of place-based specimens. A micropaleontologist by training, Lisa has extensive experience directing field-based geoscience programs on ships and shore, for underrepresented students honed during a 22 year faculty career at San Francisco State University. Yeah, so that's a that's a that's a pretty cool career history, Lisa. Thank you. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right. And get okay. started. And just as a reminder for everybody, if you are uh, looking at um, if you have any questions during the stream, go ahead and throw them in the chat and we'll make sure to ask uh, Dr. White when she's done with her talk. Great. Well, I want to thank Gabe and Brittany for inviting me to present and being so open about this topic. So what paleontologist hasn't heard, you know, is this fossil real? And this photo, this is me with like my best sour face because the 10th, you know, fifth grader just asked me, is that dinosaur real? And when you explain that, it's common to use casts and you know replicas when we have a full display. You know they just somehow seem disappointed. And I started thinking about all the times I've been asked, "Is something real?" I'm in my 30th year in this profession. I was a professor at San Francisco State University for 22 years before coming to UCMP eight years ago. And so I've tried to just take you know, all those experiences of sharing, you know, my love of paleontology and geology with others to really think about, you know, what kinds of resources can we create that help others understand just, you know, what is so great about our field and what would we want others to know if they just didn't have, you know, the level of experience uh, that we have uh, with fossils every day. So I'm going to weave um, a few questions uh, through this talk that play on that, what, it, what is real? Because I want to keep it real with you. So, you know, we've all heard, is that fossil real? Somehow uh, the audiences we sh that we share with feel like they're getting gypped, you know, if they're not holding, you know, an actual dinosaur bone. And I get a lot of, are you a real paleontologist? Because as Brittany shared, my research specialty is actually microfossils. And you know how youth are especially, they assume every paleontologist is a dinosaur expert. So on top of the fossil being a replica and I'm not a dinosaur paleontologist, I'm like, oh, I guess I've just doubly disappointed someone. And there's several other questions I wanna share with you that have really driven the way I think about how we teach and learn in paleontology and in geoscience, because I've been asked, is a certain landscape real? I don't know how many times people have asked me, you know, are you a real geologist? What, you're a scientist? You're a professor too? So I realize we can consider these like classic examples of, of microaggressions and, you know, they reflect a whole lot of biases folks have about what they perceive as who scientists are um, and what science or paleontology is. But it's a way to, you know, of just trying to focus on how it is that we share information and what do we expect people to take away uh, from the information that we share with them. 
And I think as I uh, just consider uh, my own work and the um, you know, ability to want to transfer you know, all the great things about our profession, but really understand where people are coming from when they not, may not all be familiar you know, with paleontology or geoscience or what it means to be uh, a professional. So I think of, when we think of how we define real, so what is real? Is it something authentic, you know, true to form, valid, you know, an, an actual object, not imagined, um, agrees with known facts. So I definitely agree with, with all of that. But when we're transferring information from deep time, that depends on these materials that uh, are fossilized, you know, uh, remains of past life. And we often are working with organisms that are extinct, then you can understand, you know, why someone might ask, how do we know what we know? And how do we know this is real? And there are issues of just, you know, trust of information that come up all the time, you know, when you study deep time. So I guess I just embrace all of this, you know, and I'm just determined to share with anyone who listens, you know, just how great our discipline is. And in addition to, is this fossil real? Are you a real paleontologist? Uh, I'm still, even though I'm not as research active uh, in my role as the education director at UCMP, um, I do direct a number of programs that do connect me with my research roots. So I study fossil diatoms and I look at diatomites and say in the Monterey Formation, I also go out on ships like the Joides Resolution and look at deep sea cores. And I've been fortunate with the current NSF grant to be able to take educators out on the ship uh, for multi-week experiences we call School of Rock. So not very original name, but you know they're great. Um, ways to introduce teachers to all of the scientific information that we've been able to gain over the years uh, from understanding deep ocean cores. And there are opportunities as well for uh, students to come out and certainly uh, students that are in the classes that you know these teachers instruct to just learn about how key um, understanding the deep ocean is uh, to understanding global climate. Um, as well as other uh, topics as well. Now, one of my favorite questions also is, is this landscape real? So while I was a faculty member at San Francisco State University, I directed a program called SF Rocks. So reaching out to communities and kids with science in San Francisco. And the project even grew beyond San Francisco and the Bay Area. And we partnered with multiple NSF grants with other universities to bring urban youth to some of the classic geological areas in the West. And so one particular summer, uh, we were on our way to uh, meet other groups of faculty and students uh, in Utah. And you know, many of you know, just how breathtaking the scenery is in these places. And we had prepared the students through some you know, instructional guides and we had a whole pre-field course for them so that they would be prepared to learn in the field. But one of our first stops, and actually it was just before the image in the top there, that's the Goblin Valley in Utah. So we get there and you know how it is when you're doing field work, there are long drives, sometimes you're not paying attention, you don't know where you are, you know, if you're not driving. So we get out and I'm ready to share, you know, the, the basic uh, backdrop and origin of the area where we're examining. And the first question from a student is, is this real? Is this landscape real? And I was taken aback. I was like, you know, I didn't quite know what to say. First, I was mad. I was like, now we just spent NSF money, you know, to get you out here. And I've been explaining that these rocks are formed by erosion and everything. But after I calmed down, you know, I realized what the student was sharing is that not that much in his background had really prepared him for nature on that scale. And even those of us with the trained eye, you can't believe what you see. You know, it's even more beautiful than the postcard. You just think, you know, what combination of, you know, earth events occur to carve the landscape in that way. 
So I, I try to just really embrace like the awesomeness of earth science, but realize that sometimes you have to deliver it in doses because you know it can be just a little bit overwhelming and cause students to question, you know, what what is it about what we're seeing? And if there aren't always modern analogs, you know, to some of the areas that we see, especially we know the depth of time and length of time it takes to carve this, then you know, it's fine and good to question. So I've certainly made it my life's work to connect all kinds of communities with field spaces, uh, with learning about, you know, rocks and landscapes and of course fossils. Um, and I must say, and this next slide will show, I question my own understanding of the landscape because prior to discovering geology as an undergraduate at San Francisco State, I actually wanted to be a landscape photographer. So I was fashioning myself as the, um, you know, the black female Ansel Adams. So I majored in photography. I was doing my own black and white, um, uh, developing and just, you know, wanting to really capture like Ansel Adams did all these beautiful landscape areas. Because when you look at photos like that, you know, even if you've been there before, you're familiar with these areas, you still just can't believe, you know, that nature can be that beautiful and that it's so real. And for me, I started asking more questions about how the landscape formed than I was asking myself about how to get the best shot. So I thought, hmm, you know, I should probably learn something more about the landscape if I'm to be a good photographer. And then I ended up taking geology classes at San Francisco State, loved it, switched my major. And I have to reflect for a minute too on, um, so this year was the, let's see, was it the 40th anniversary of when Mount St. Helens erupted? And that's the year I changed my major to geology. I was sort of on that path already because um, I was taking geology to understand the landscape for photography. But sometimes the, you know, earth events just are so awesome and, you know, impressionable that it certainly was for me. Uh, so I, I know what it's like to not always have, you know, the, the full set of skills to allow one to interpret what it is that we're seeing. And we want to keep, you know, that sense of awe and that sense of awesomeness when we, we teach and learn. Uh, so the next is that real I want to share is, you know, are you a real geologist? So the stereotypes of geologists are, you know, singed in everyone's mind. And no matter how many women geoscientists there are now, you know, there certainly are not enough geoscientists of color. And so I've traveled to more than 35 countries. You know, I've done field work on land, on ships. I wear the gear. Look, I have my fossil shirt on over here. This is me at the KT boundary in Montana. This is doing some field work, uh, the image there on the lower right in the Central Valley of California. And then I was featured in a Nova production with Kirk Johnson, the director of the Smithsonian um, called Making North America. And yet I'm still often, people question, are you a geologist? And I think, well, that's what my degrees say. I'm like, hey, I have like 40 years or uh, 35 years worth of experience, you know, as a professional. I've been on Nova, darn it, but you know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't look, if I don't look like what uh, people are used to, then, you know, that's part, part of my experience. And I've also been part of networks and organizations that uh, just, and programs that really just try to capture, you know, what it means to be um, either a scientist of color, a, a woman geoscientist. So the Bearded Lady Project, uh, we actually don beards to, really challenge, you know, what one's image is of a geoscientist or a geoscientist that does field work. And in the upper right there, um, a good friend, Gillian Bowser, who's an artist. So this is the other extreme of like, you're an earth goddess, you know, you're a supernatural or a unicorn, you know, you're so unique. Let's, you know, make you this, you know, image of, you know, a sort of um, superhero kind of thing. And, but my favorite though, for Black History Month a few years ago, uh, um, an elementary school student in Florida contacted me and said he was making a postage stamp with my likeness 
for uh, Black History Month. So, you know, it doesn't get any better than that, right? Uh, so again, when people just question, are you this or are you real? And I have to share that I am a second generation um, professor. So my late father, uh, Joseph White, was a psychologist. He actually really helped define the field of Black psychology. And he and my mom as well were very involved in social justice, civil rights. And so I guess I was destined to do this kind of work in STEM. But when I was faculty member at San Francisco State, my first few years, whenever someone would say Professor White, you know, I, I would look for my dad. So even my own, you know, identity and the, the way I primarily identified, you know, wasn't necessarily as a professor. So just thinking about all that, you know, how people perceive our profession, how, you know, geoscientists of color have to really code switch a lot and, and think about our own experiences in the profession, you know, what we want to bring and represent if we seek to broaden who participates in our science. So over the years, and especially since I've been at UCMP, you know, I just think about what do I want to create that is relatable to a wide variety of people? You know, we, we want to keep it real, right? So we want the resources to be authentic, true to form, you know, valid, evidence-based, really represent the areas where uh, we work or the collections that our museums house. You know, even though, sure, science, it's fascinating, it's magical, but, you know, but it's real. It's not imagined. These landscapes are real, fossils are real, rocks represent um, very um, measurable processes. But what I want us to be able to do is uh, sure recognize that what we present that is evidence of past life, you know, should agree with the known facts, but we don't have to agree to stereotypical images of who does earth science or who paleontologists are. So I know it's easy for me to say as a, as a woman, as a person of color, when I um, create resources, you know, it's important to show that you have a diversity of people working on your team. But some of us are at labs, museums, universities, in regional areas where it may be difficult to have a diversity of individuals on your team. So these are all the kinds of things that we need to continue to work towards, you know, just expanding our base of partnerships and in the times we live in and the ability to work, you know, clearly uh, virtually, you know, across regional global areas, I feel like there's no excuse for not having, you know, more uh, diverse working partnerships. And, and I'm really kind of, you know, camera shy when it comes to it. it's like, don't put me in a video. Do I really need to? But as I've been working with um, one of our NSF funded collections projects, we've been building out our uh, resources uh, in ways that bring uh, field experiences to the collections. And so uh, this involves going to some classic geological field areas, areas where I would take my students when I was faculty at San Francisco State. And so it got to the point where in addition to capturing, you know, these great uh, areas with gigapan photography, uh, at some point I thought, well, I should probably be on camera like explaining what it is. Otherwise someone may think again, this is not real or who is it that's bringing this information anyway. So I've tried to get out in front of the camera a little bit more and also capture and bring uh, to life some of the great students that I work with at Berkeley. And I'm also often aware of just the imagery of what it is that we present and you know, even our logo. So one of the other projects I have, which really supports instructors at thinking about more inclusive practices in the field. And so the acronym, and you can see with the logo uh, in the lower right there, field, so field work, inspiring, expanded leadership and diversity. And so an artist designed that logo for us. And we wanted to be able to show, you know, just with a silhouette that, you know, we don't all look the same in geoscience and that, you know, we're really embracing our, our diversity. 
And when I, again, just think about other ways, especially with the virtual field work that we wanna be able to capture, you know, what we actually do, you know, scientists working, scientists, you know, working in teams and partnerships. And, and this simple trick uh, will just that a colleague at UCMP has said over and over again, you know, people are more likely to engage with a photograph of a fossil if there's like a human in it and a hand in particular. And research shows that folks are more likely to click on an image, you know, if, if they see someone holding a fossil. So I'm all about it now, you know, we have that a lot. And two, it's just, you know, make that human connection. And, and it also helps, and there's a lot of literature on just drawing from a sense of the place where you're working. And so um, there are many kinds of connections with diverse communities that can be made from uh, just thinking about, you know, uh, resources and areas that may be um, near these communities. And I wanted to also just acknowledge just the times that we live in, which just make it possible for so many awesome, you know, digital resources to be available for our use. And so um, I use a lot of these and promote them as well. So the epic virtual field experiences. So this is the arm um, of a, a digitization project we have with many other museums that focuses on the Cenozoic along the West Coast. And so the virtual field experiences we have available, uh, you can check out. And of course, I dig bio, which uh, allows uh, many of us with these digitization grants to really integrate. Um, I'm a fan of Time Scavengers that uh, really gives excellent examples of um, areas in deep time um, that have, I think, really special meaning. The Digital Atlas of Life has so many excellent resources. And of course, if you're a college instructor partic in particular, Teach the Earth. And then all the sites where you can upload 3D images from um, Sketchfab, the MOFA source, and of course the paleobiology database. So as I um, wind down the talk, you know, I just want to challenge you as you, if you're an instructor and you know you're hoping to, or a museum professional and you want to engage broader and more diverse audiences, then I think just you know crafting some key questions in the beginning of your resource design. You know, even if you have the fossils already, you have a sense of what digital images that uh, you might want to use, then let's just ask, you know, how would this resource or program, you know, specifically support, you know, diversity, inclusion, inclusion and participation of people from, you know, fill in the blank. Do you want to work with your, you know, next community over? You know, are you seeking to attract more students of color? Are you not engaging the rural students from um, where you are? Is that you want to partner with another museum? So I think if we can be you know, a little bit more strategic from the beginning of how and why we want to engage people and, and what might be interesting to that group. You know, do you ever ask them what they might be interested in? And maybe utilize more strongly um, the, the place um, the certain periods of time that, you know, may be of interest. And, you know, above all, we as earth science educators, as paleontologists, scientists, you know, interested in drawing um, more people to our discipline um, is what we share um, digitally and through our resources. You know, is it designed to facilitate the kind of exploration and engagement and interactivity uh, that we hope? You know, knowing that we can't all go to the field, especially now, and you know, we know the reliance that we're going to continue to have on remote sharing and digital resources. So, you know, what are some ways that that we can really, really help that come to life? And so, it's a you know an ongoing challenge. But you know, as I stepped into my role at the UCMP, I long used resources from UCMP, even as a faculty member and you know, two years ago, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of the UCMP website. Of course, we all take for granted uh, the ability to share things on the web, but UCMP 
direct use of the web was really novel in the early 90s when that happened. And so since I've been director of education and outreach, you know, I've really tried to draw attention to the ways in which we can utilize our resources, whether it's our go-to popular ones from understanding um, evolution and understanding science, uh, as well as all of the resources on the fossil record that we have, you know, how can we utilize those resources to um, attract new audiences and how can we create, you know, new kinds of resources as well. So I've been working on that and, and so we recently designed this diversity and inclusion page to highlight some of the things we're doing. This is just a few of the programs. I think there are um, 10 that are listed on the page. And um, much of this work in, involves teams of people, graduate students at Berkeley who come up with ideas, you know, my partners in the ocean science community who are very much motivated to increase diversity. I've become part of networks now uh, that are really interested in improving the experience for undergraduate students in biology and really drawing from uh, data, databases, and museum collections uh, so that students learn. So th there are lots of opportunities. I think we need to be more strategic uh, when we think about creating these real, you know, relatable resources that uh, draw on, you know, good science and evidence-based practices, but we want to be sure, you know, as we show the people that are doing the work and why we even do the work and what regions that we emphasize, uh, that we are sensitive to how we're perceived because we are, you know, fighting those perceptions that, you know, maybe the work that we do um, isn't real. So I just want to um, thank my hosts. I found these great photos. So that's Gabe and Brittany when we were all at SVP, the Society for Vertebrate Paleontology Museum in Alberta. So that's at the Royal Terrell. And then the photo on the right was the first time I met Gabe was in 2016 at GSA in Denver. Uh, he had been awarded a best a student poster. So thank you so much and um, happy to answer any questions. <laughs> thank you so much, Lisa. And I love that picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, surprise. I totally forgot about <laughs> Remember that. Remember that? We were at the room. <laughs> Big trip. Um, we did the Terrell together. That was so yeah. fun. Yeah, it was very fun. <laughs> we, were so, we were so hyper that day just because like we were taking a break yes. from SVP right. and we were so excited and the first thing we see when we get over there is that big statue and then me and Brittany and media are like yeah. Lisa take our picture <laughs> and then we were like are we allowed to be here and you're just like just take it it's fine <laughs> we're paleontologists Not right I don't know if we're trespassing or what but we're <laughs> yeah I think we were a little stir crazy after like three days of conferencing and an hour and a half drive to get like right. through the Canadian wilderness to get to the Toronto Thank I you. know <laughs> oh thank you Lisa that was an amazing mm -hmm. time okay yeah exactly. it definitely was and i want to say also really quick that for those of you who are who are listening or just learning about lisa now for a lot of people who go to society of vertebrate paleontology or gsa lisa has been an amazing mentor for so many and she you always will find time to see us as people first and not just scientists and so from like the bottom of my heart and on behalf of so many other paleontologists who are in my friend group and others, just thank you. Cause you've done so much to really make this place feel more, more, ex you know, more accessible and open to people. And, you know, I know for me, I I've always liked science education, but after meeting you in 2016 and also like knowing about your work before then, I've really like, been inspired to transition my career into education um so yeah thank oh, you you're welcome and you know there, there's such a positive feedback uh with you and members of the svp community that are interested in education and outreach and i love all the ideas we share and just the can-do spirit you know and and but i am really dedicated to sharing that it's it's just a great 
part of our discipline, you know, education in, in science, in geoscience. And there's so many excellent opportunities, especially now as we all seek to draw more diverse audiences to our work. You know, if we can't do it now with all the tools that we have, and I think the drive to be different, then, you know, I don't know when we do it, but I, I really love that people are truly engaged to, yeah, make, making a difference. So if I need to lead that effort, I'm ready. Like my dad would always be like, right, you know, he was like the raise your fist even before the symbol of <laughs> it's old school revolutionary, you know, so I'm like, let's do it. <laughs> and I will say on a personal note, Lisa, you've always been super encouraging to me. Um, you, it, which is just so nice. Like when I went to conferences and stuff, I was so nervous. I was so worried um, just because I have a very unique background in paleontology and was like, oh, am I supposed to do this? Like, am I able to do this? So yeah, you just immediately were like, yep, hi, welcome. And yeah, on a personal note, you've been super encouraging to me personally. And I know that that's extended to multiple people and students um, across our field. So and I, like I said, when we when we started, I still have the uh, mammoth button. You can I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just like, oh my gosh, she's so sweet. So we have a lot of great questions coming up okay. in the chat. So I'm going to go ahead and go through some of those. So um, let's see. Okay, here's one. Uh, this is from uh, Carolyn Abbott, and Carolyn was actually um, previously a previous speaker on our on our uh, Fossil Friday chat. So. She says one thing she's frustrated by is scientists deciding that talking with people who have gained a mistrust of science isn't their problem. How do you navigate that frustration while still encouraging scientists to meet students, museum vid visitors, et cetera, where they're at? Right. Well, we've taken the philosophy at UCMP and you see this on our Understanding Evolution website that we, you know, we, we can't walk away completely from folks who might be anti-science, anti-evolution, don't believe in this and that, and just try to share resources. You know, we're not gonna solve any problems by never talking to, you know, a climate change denier or someone who doesn't believe in evolution. It's not my favorite thing to do, but chances are uh, that individual has a kid in school or it might be, you know, a young person who's learning. So I'm, Certainly, I, so my sort of go-to response is just, you know, sharing resources, just highlighting all of the evidence, um, you know, ways that we can learn more. If they're confused or um, just have misconceptions, you know, we have a whole page on the Understanding Evolution website about misconceptions and just kind of walking people through, you know, this is why we know the earth is this old and this is how we know that you know life descended from this common ancestor so you know people are just willing to listen and um i just yeah i point folks to resources but it but it, it does it is a challenge for us and sometimes it does feel like a burden it's like who wants to spend an afternoon you know talking with a denier but, but i feel like we're ready you know we've got resources and people who were skilled, the um, NCSC in Oakland, the National Center for Science Education, they've been our partner in past work and they have some great web resources too on just working with communities that are non-believers. So. Great, and here's another good question. Um, this is from Cam. Um, are you getting the opportunity to go out into the field this summer field field work and secondly, you briefly mentioned you have a speciality in micropaleontology. Have yeah. you dabbled in palynology, specifically late Cretaceous palynology? Okay. So I'm like so many of us have been disappointed this summer and not being able to go out in the field. Uh, some possible trips I was going to go on. I was going to meet a ship in Ireland and sail to Iceland. And then the School of Rock was supposed to be in Brazil. So I'm like, I wasn't even supposed to be here this week, but you know, that the ship will be there. We will get back out to sea. But the nice thing about the multiple programs I have is that there are, there will be future summers, you know, we can get people out to sea. And so when I learned my craft uh, in diatom microfossils, I was interning at the U.S. Geological Survey in Menlo Park. 
And there were a team of us then of both students and professionals in micropaleontology. So there was a palynologist, you know, a pollen expert that was just down the hall. You know, there were 4M people, radiolarian experts. And so I feel like that in my training in micropaleontology, I certainly got a taste of those other disciplines, not so much late Cretaceous. I pretty much have been focused on the Cenozoic, but even the times that I've gone out to sea. So I've been a shipboard scientist twice on the Joides Resolution uh, drill ship. And so you're always sharing the lab with other micropaleontologists. That's awesome. <laughs> I know. I've been able, I was able to join Lisa for like one day on the Joides Resolution and that was such a cool experience being able to do being able to see how people do science on a ship right um, and also how you take students onto that is just so fascinating because you know being in a museum mm -hmm. like it's just a very different experience <laughs> seeing how everything can move and like all the different pieces and even learning about how you guys all do the the different hour shifts that was just exactly. crazy to me yeah it's like a sociological experiment you know these 12 hour shifts sometimes you get the late night, but when the ship is in U.S. ports, as it was last year, it was in the port of San Diego, and so uh, Gabe met me, and we did a program for educators. And so even when you're not sailing, but when you have an opportunity to be on the ship, you yeah, you just can't believe what it's capable of doing, the technology, uh, you know, what's expected of the scientists, the routines, and um, yeah, it's a fascinating learning environment. It it really is. Here's another good question. This is from our uh, friend of the uh, both of our museums, Rob Soto, um, who's a paleo artist. Yep. In creating these resources, mm -hmm. how can the artistic re reconstruction side of paleontology help to broaden the public's understanding of the diversity in paleontology and challenge their perceptions, especially with so much in the mainstream media, um, specifically thinking of an upcoming documentary that's going to probably feature, um, you know, the stereotypical idea of a paleontologist you know right yeah i'm just so you know we're very sensitive to that and and i am fortunate to have a great team of education and outreach staff that includes a graphic artist a science writer you know web manager and i'm thinking too of a conversation i had with a filmmaker who is at the university of rhode island she has a series her name's kendall moore on a series is difficult conversations around race and can we talk is what the film is and so she asks just a range of questions to scientists in a range of stem fields you know scientists of color you know just what their experiences are like just combating stereotypes you know struggles dealing with aggressions but she is going to start a new series in her film that's around uh, stem and colonization and the role museums have in that, you know, from where did our collections come from? Do we really have the right permission? You know, who's doing the work? What kinds of scientists do you involve in um, your work? And and when so when artists and filmmakers like that, you know, shine a, a lens on the work we do and our practices, you know, it's it's all the more revealing that we're we're not there yet. I mean, we're getting there, but it's, yeah, we're just, just there's just a lot of walls and lots of conservative traditions that I think make it hard for people to just, you know, break in to the profession. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Go for it, Gabe. I was going to say, like, no, definitely, like, because um, I remember my very first SVP even, and you know, even though I knew like one or two people still walking around and just kind of learning about some of the the unsaid traditions of things really, if you, if it's your first time just makes you feel like, ooh, I don't know any of this. I don't know if I should be in this place right now. Right. And Gabe and Brittany, I mean, and, and we're regular SVP attendees, but you still feel that way sometimes. And then, you know, depending on what city it's in or what, you know, just have a different vibe. And so, yeah, those, those traditions, you know, die hard. 
on that note, <laughs> so Isaac, uh, who, uh, Megan Yanis, who's, an, who's another previous speaker of the uh, Fossil Friday web chats, mm -hmm. had a really good question and a really fun question. Okay. Um, so in addition to the, re uh, the required equipment necessary for field work, hammer, right. uh, digging tools, all of that, what are the fun things that you like to bring when you do field work? He says he personally likes to bring a good book and some tunes. So yeah. <laughs> what do you like to bring on your field trip expedition? What do you bring with you when you have to be on a ship when I have to be on a ship, okay, definitely the tunes. And this is a prompt a little bit because Isaac knows the story of like, oh, maybe people are sick of hearing it, but I'll tell a short version of it. So, you know, I'm a firm believer, you know, you, you bring with you what you enjoy doing when you're not working. And, you know, we all love music. So I think, and of course, you know, reading and um, if there are, you know, small hobbies that you can bring but it's hard to think of being away for weeks or even months at a time, you know, without your music. And so when I was an undergrad and so enthusiastic and excited to have this field assistant position with the USGS and my first summer, they took a group of us to Alaska on a project, you know, we were field hands and everything. And in the field projects that I run now, one of the first things I give to students is a, is a packing list. This folks are sometimes unfamiliar if that, if they haven't spent a lot of time outdoors, but you know, the professional geoscientists didn't have time for that, you know, to give me a packing list. So I overpacked the music and you know, it was the eighties. So your music meant like cassette tapes. And like, it wasn't a boom box, you know, it wasn't a ghetto blaster, but it was definitely a tape player that really didn't need to be in my backpack, you know, when I was supposed to be carrying rocks. And so, oh my God, I just, um, yeah. So I got into a little situation where I was supposed to be carrying like so many rocks that day after we had been, you know, in this area in Alaska, but I didn't realize like the backpack for the rocks it had to be the one that like couldn't have my music in it. So anyway, I was not a good field assistant that day because, you know, I'm going to have my music with me. So that was what, you know, I thought is priority when you're out. I thought someone else was going to handle like the field equipment. So, yeah. So to this day, when I'm out with students, I mean, we're all so lucky now, you know, our music is on our phone, but I just try to be patient with like the crazy things people sometimes bring with them to the field. I'm like, well, if I could practically bring a ghetto blaster and like 20 cassette tapes and not be able to carry any rocks, then I just need to calm down. You know, if the student is bringing, I don't know what, but, <laughs> but it is kind of a thing. I mean, around just like equipment. And, and again, this is where we don't know how much we burden people with expectations of, what you know how to behave in the field and what you bring don't bring that and you know it just further isolates many people from wanting to like fully embrace that experience because you're expected to behave just like you know the people leading the trip so yeah that's an excellent point though because you know i mean i've been guilty of this sometimes it's like we become so part of the culture that when someone's completely brand new and then they don't know what they're doing, you kind of will just like make fun of them without realizing it. Like, what do you mean you don't know? But then what do you mean you don't know what to bring to the field? But then for a lot of people, their first field experience is their very first field experience, like their first time going anywhere. I mean, I know like for me, I've been in the field a few times, not as much as some, but even then I'm still kind of overpacking. I mean, I bring an air mattress and my iPad and my solar chargers. Gabe is ready. Of course Gabe does bring yeah. all the time. <laughs> I mean, for me personally, I, my family didn't camp. Uh, like we, that's not a thing that we ever did when I was growing up. And so when I started going out into the field and doing long hikes and um, that kind of thing, it's like, I've never camped before. Right. Like I got what to do. So. Exactly. <laughs> I like to fix my hair in the field. So what? I like to look good, even if yeah, it's for no one else. It's for me. Products. Yeah, I don't blame you at all for that game. I completely get it. <laughs> um, 
Here's another good question. This is from uh, Dr. McDonald, our curator at the Western Science Center. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the most challenging landscape you've had to explain to students? And how did you make the connection for them between the present landscape and the past process that developed that landscape? Okay, that's a great question. Um, you know, from an, an instructional uh, view, one of the hardest landscapes, it seems, students um, had trouble interpreting were some of the plateau basalt areas and the, the gorges and the deep canyons uh, in, say, Idaho. I remember one trip through there. And so it's one thing to recognize a flat landscape area with just all one kind of rock, you know, and I could explain that to them. But when all of a sudden it just drops off and, you know, there's a deep crevice that's been carved that clearly had to take, you know, years and years, millions of years, the concepts of, of deep time, you know, and the challenges of, I think, you know, beginning students to really understand that, you know, yes, some of the rivers that we see now, uh, if their capacity is increased, you know, if there's a tremendous flood, then there is the potential to carve, you know, that deep over some time into that. And so it, it seems that when, yeah, there are dramatic changes in, in elevation um, is where I think that sense of awe really comes up. And, you know, I just try to do exercises with the students and both in the field and of course in the lab to just emphasize, you know, scales of change and magnitude. And um, of course you try through animations and graphics to really highlight, you know, how erosion happens. And, and, and that's where I think, you know, we are fortunate. There are so many different kinds of tools we can use, you know, think of Google Earth and all of the, um, you know, uh, remote data that we can look at, the spatial data from around the globe to show features that are similar and really think about, you know, the, the power of water and, and erosion over long periods of time. Cool. Yeah, I, I find me personally, visualization always helps. That's a really good point. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I'm having to go through a lot of comments commenting about uh, from uh, people about like what they also bring in the field. Oh, oh, what are some? Can you read some to me? Yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, hair dye and nail polish. Somebody has a favorite dry shampoo brand, which I, yes, you have to bring dry shampoo out into the field. Um, yep. Uh, let's see. There's a hashtag now. Hashtag GeoChick. Okay. Nail polish. Somebody has a favorite dry shampoo. <laughs> I never pronounce things correctly. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm having to go through the uh, discussion in the comments about everybody. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, yeah, everybody. And then I know people have their favorite foods. And, and actually, field food has gotten so much better. I mean, really, I ate sea rations, like those combat rations that when I did field work with the USGS, that was it. There was, you know, there was no designer fruit and whatever we now Noki, <laughs> right? Gabe has to have right his <laughs> it's Noki. That was one time. <laughs> actually actually I remember one of my very first field experiences when I was in my master's program at Cal State Fullerton. Mm -hmm. Um we were doing field technique classes yeah. um because I was taking undergrad classes. Right. And <laughs> I decided for me and my group, you know, Isaac was one was my classmate in that thing. I was like, I'm gonna bring Korean barbecue for dinner this night. So I brought the whole field stove. I like fr my, we froze like the Korean barbecue in a in a cooler. And that night when we come back from the field, I started making we started making Korean barbecue in the field, and it was like great. But everyone else was just like, really? Yes, really. Really? I was like, you're just jealous. You're not hey, enjoying our food. You're gonna want yeah. Just I know they. Get you, just like the music I brought, you know, I got told off for having all those darn cassettes. But then that evening, I was a DJ. They were like, well, you might as well play this music. I'm like, see, see, you want to hear, don't you? <laughs> all right. Here's a, um, another good question. Uh, this is from Tara. Uh, okay. Someday when we can be interacting in the field again with students, yeah. is there yeah. something 
local teachers and students can do to bring students into the field, whether that's partnering with the museum, um, if there are collected fossils, et cetera, and educating about the need for proper permitting, or are there big hurdles? Well, you know, one, one of our go-to spots in the Bay Area is in Santa Cruz County, Capitola Beach. So it's, it's the subject of one of our virtual field experiences and some of the courses at Berkeley and also at SF State and other Bay Area universities go to that uh, area, that outcrop. You know, it's fossil rich, it's easy to get to. The city of Capitola does allow collecting um, but, you know, we don't encourage it with students, but it's, it's not that far, you know, from the Bay Area cities and, you know, it's a great outcrop when it's low tide um, that you can see. And then even, you know, I, I live in San Francisco and uh, Ocean Beach, so our uh, beach here, there are some outcrops of a Pleistocene unit that's fossiliferous. It, uh, it's park service. It's National Park Service, so you can't collect without a permit, but at least you can see, you know, fossils and rocks. And yes, yeah, so I find that students don't have a lot of opportunities to see fossils in situ. You know, you hand them, you hand it to them at the museum and you explain where it's from. But yeah, there's there's nothing like actually taking them to the field. So yeah, so there's some coastal places and I mean, there are even some areas of the Berkeley Hills are not very fossiliferous though. It doesn't take too long yet yeah, to, to get to the coast. So I love taking people out there and I've taken teachers, students, you know, those areas. Mm -hmm. So good local options. Yeah. We have um, a couple more questions left. Mm -hmm. um, so let me, oh, more, uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, just for funs funsies, there's uh, other things to bring into the fields are uh, a sketchbook. That's a good oh. idea. When I like to do yeah. that. Uh, one of our friends has said fire dancing equipment. Oh, oh yeah, it does really amuse me the evening programs, you know, around the campfire. People <laughs> bring guitars, of course, but fire dance. You know. a good question from Carolyn. What's the coolest science aha moment you've had or have seen a student have? Okay. Well, the one I shared from the um, Southwest area when the student asked me, was that real? You know, was in Utah and then Canyonlands that, you know, such an, an awesome landscape. You know, I, I think back to my very first international field experience was when I was a graduate student. So I went to graduate school at UC Santa Cruz and my professor was working in Israel and Egypt on a project. And so I was able to go with him the, uh, at, at the end of my first year of grad school. And, um, and I, well, it was my first time traveling internationally and I'd never really worked as a geologist in a desert setting. And so I was just amazed at how well you could see the rocks and the dramatic landscapes. And then of course, the um, historical features in Egypt that include the pyramids. But um, yeah, so I think, Desert landscapes for me are just so awesome and um, inspiring, I think, because of all the rocks that you can see. So I tend to really sort of my, my go-to happy place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, where I where the museum is located, Hemet, is in a desert area. And I've grown up in the desert. And so it's really interesting because for me, when I go to areas that are not desert biomes, that's when I go like, oh my goodness, this is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's green or it's yeah. I'll have that, that Ray in Star Wars Force Awakens moment, which was like, I've never seen so much green in my whole life. <laughs> when I get out of the desert, that's when I'm like really shocked. So, but it is nice to like think when a lot of people don't have experience with the desert and they come here and see how beautiful it is. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. Okay, and I think this will be our uh, final question for Jay. And this is actually from uh, Cam Muskelly, who is our oh. next speaker at 3 p.m. Yeah. Um, so you explained a little bit about this earlier, but he wants to know, when did you really decide you wanted to be a paleontologist? Okay. Well, it was a combination of things. So, you know, the early major uh, in photography as an undergraduate, but uh, taking landscape, um, taking an interest in landscape photography eventually led to my love of landscapes and geology. But the paleontology focus 
You know, I'd say it came from the years interning at the USGS. You know, I think we take it for granted now that students have a research experience in the summer. It's pretty much required if you want to go to graduate school. But in those days, it was just, oh, if we can get some work during the summer that's relevant, great. And so at the time, I don't know that I fully appreciated the opportunity to have mentors, you know, besides my professors and have this research experience. And one summer I worked with a micropaleontologist and she is a woman. And, and so it was really my first connection with a female geoscientist who happened to be a micropaleontologist. And so I was really influenced by the projects uh, that she was working on. She was also really committed to education and outreach, which you know, I fully embraced as well. But yeah, it was through an internship experience. And, and I think also because the rocks all around me, so in San Francisco and the Bay Area, they're all marine, you know, deep marine. Our bedrock here, the Franciscan complex is uh, made up largely of chert and radial area. And so I guess it would just be fitting, you know, that I'd end up studying fine grain rocks and, and microfossils. And then now working at UCMP and being part of the vertebrate paleontology community, you know, it's really nice to be more of a generalist and try to keep up with, um, you know, advances in other sub disciplines of paleo. So I can, you know, write a lesson about it or something. But yeah, it's those key experiences, I think, as interns that really shape, you know, how you decide on the profession. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. That was incredible, incredibly um, encouraging. And so I really enjoyed it. And it looks like from our comments yeah. that our viewers really enjoyed it. Great. Well, it was my pleasure and it's very fun to share what I do and, you know, my love of the subject. And yeah, I just hope it, it was useful and informative for everyone. Awesome. Oh, it definitely was. And thank you again, Lisa. You're welcome. Um, and uh, if anybody, if anybody's going to, you know, their first GSA or SVP, definitely like look out for Dr. Lisa White or, you know, us, because, yep. you know, we also are really fun paleontologists. Yep. We'd like to have fun. A great network, and I miss seeing you all in person, and just look forward to when we can, you know, get together in a meeting again. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Thank you again, Dr. Lisa White, and um, as always, everyone, um, we'll have links to uh, various resources in the chat and information um, about our museums afterwards. And join us again at 3 p.m. for our next talk by Cameron Muskelly, who will be teaching us all about the deep fossil history of Georgia and also his work in the community there. So that's going to be very good. Okay. Thanks, Gabe. Thanks, Brittany. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Later. Bye, okay. everybody. Bye-bye.